For the second section of chapter 8, we will be talking about meiosis, which is a process that happens with sexual reproduction cells. Alright, so this is the basic outline. What I'm going to talk about on this video, I'm going to try and cover some ground of things that you already know about your life to give you somewhere to stand in reference to trying to understand what's going on with meiosis. So I'll show you some things about your genetics, your cr chromosomes, what everybody as far as we know in this room has. Uh, we're, I'll, talk, I'll cover some vocabulary, uh, words that may be confusing in this video and uh, a definition so that you can try to keep up and make sure you understand the proper meaning of what is said. Then we'll move into my meiosis. Basically there are two main parts, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. It may help if when you study mitosis, you remember the order of things, the PMATC. So that's going to happen in meiosis in part one and then again in part two, although there are just a couple little things that are different. So if you can at least establish the pattern of mitosis in your brain, that'll make understanding meiosis a little easier. After we go through meiosis, which will take the majority of the time, We'll touch a little bit on why genetic variation and recombination is important and how your cells, my cells, everyone's cells are not perfect. There are mistakes with all of that microscopic copying of hundreds of thousands of little DNA molecules. Mistakes happen, um, not only in those lines, but also along the lines of the meiotic and mitotic process. When the cells divide, things don't always go as planned. So here we go. First, we'll touch on vocabulary a little bit. I know you, you've heard these words before, but I hope by now you'll understand what they mean. Haploid and diploid are two sort of words. Maybe when you see them together, understand that diploid means die, so two, two sets of chromosomes. Haploid means within some cell or some organism, there is only one set of chromosomes, a full set of chromosomes. So in people, in us, we have 23 sets or 23 chromosomes essentially but we are diploid creatures so each of our cells besides our gametes or sex cells being eggs and sperm they each contain 46 total chromosomes because it's two sets of 23 and each individual is different each species is different in the number of chromosomes that they have so uh, that's why haploid and diploid are used because not everybody has 23 chromosomes now somatic cells when things come up in this video and other videos where they refer to somatic cells they are referring to cells in your body basically not sex cells not gametes gametes are eggs and sperm so another new word may be a zygote, and that is essentially what happens when an egg and a sperm fuse and come together. Then it's a fertilized egg, which begins, the cells begin to rapidly divide and become a new individual. Crossing over is something we're going to touch on here, where you have homologous chromosomes. You've seen the X's. You un hopefully you understand that they uh, are in pairs in a diploid organism. And in meiosis, there is a stage where the arms of those X's basically fold over each other, and this is when genes are swapped. This is how you get your dad's nose and your mother's eyes, essentially. Well, it, to, to put it as crudely as possible. And those homologous chromosomes, okay, so people have 23 chromosomes, and they're basically named 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And you have a pair of each, so you have two number one chromosomes, you have two number two chromosomes. So each of your number one chromosomes are homologous, so those are your homologous chromosomes. So the next picture um, will make that a little more clear. Or not, I'm sorry, not the next picture, the first picture in the next series. To get started, let's cover some information that you already know. We've talked about this a little bit. You know that you got genes from your mom and genes from your dad. You are not an exact copy of your mother. You are not an exact copy of your father. Even if you think you are, like you're the spitting image of your mother, not all of your genes are the same. It's extremely unlikely, and you'll figure that out later when you realize there are 8 million different possibilities 
possible combinations just for you and your genes alone. Anyway, so if humans have 23 chromosomes, mom gave you 23 and dad gave you 23, meaning you have 46 chromosomes in all of your cells. And that's where your pairs come from. Each part of a pair came from one parent. That means you have two copies of each and every gene in your body. I'm sure you've heard of how some are dominant or recessive and that determines how your genes are expressed in your being. An example that's very familiar, we know that brown eyes are, are dominant over a blue eye gene or darker hair is generally dominant over a blonde just as far as genes are concerned. And that's oversimplifying it. These genes actually have many loci or locations that come into play to determine your actual phenotypic expression. Um, a phenotype is just how the gene is expressed in your body. Uh, but, okay, enough about that. You need to know you have two copies of every gene. So you have two copies of 23 chromosomes giving you 46 chromosomes. Let's get into meiosis. So you understand that your mother has 46 chromosomes. Everybody has 46 chromosomes in their body cells. So did your dad. So how in the world were they each able to give you only 23? Okay, that means that one egg and one sperm only have 23 chromosomes. And there's a special process that makes sure they only get half so that the next individual has the right number of genes. Now this is a karyotype. That's this picture here. When you can get this done just to see what the chromosomes are like and oftentimes this is used to determine if some people have what's called a trisomy 21. We're going to get into that later. So if you look at these pictures, this is your pair. This is chromosome 1. So this is one chromosome, say from mom. This is one chromosome from dad. You can tell that these are each duplicated already. Okay, so these are ready to go through the my meiotic or mitotic process. The sister chromatids make one solid X, but this is how you have one copy, two copies of each gene that appears on these chromosomes. And these are each homologous chromosomes. So here as people, this shows all 23. It stops at 22 because the difference here, this individual or the individual who has these chromosomes is a male. And you've probably heard of this before. Male is XY, female is XX. So females actually have the full 23 pair. Males have 22 chromosome pairs with one X and one Y. It still makes 46 chromosomes, but it's, um, they're not the same. As you can tell, Y is very, very small and X is much larger. Of course, this is why if there are genes on the X chromosome, that are say deleterious or bad, uh, they're often expressed more in males because males don't have a secondary X to try to override any bad genes on this X. It's, it's kind of a bummer, um, but that's another discussion for later in the semester. So moving on. Okay, so this is just going to be a real brief introduction to how meiosis divides the chromosomes. Looking at the cell, this is just an example where one version of one chromosome from dad, one version of a chromosome from mom. And then in interphase, before meiosis, each chromosome is duplicated. So these are a pair of homologous chromosomes. Sort of like the last picture that we saw, you could just pretend that they are chromosome one. You've got one from mom, one from dad, and they've been duplicated. During the first stage of meiosis, it actually separates each pair of your chromosomes. This is where you go from 46 to 23. If you want to think of it very simply, even though it doesn't really happen this way, this is where you separate the genes you got from mom and the genes you got from dad in order to be duplicated. Now, they have already been duplicated, but since you have two copies of each gene, they have to be separated into one. Then, in the second stage of meiosis, that's when each individual chromosome gets separated by, or at the centromere, and you're left with four haploid cells. 
These are also haploid because they do not have a pair of each chromosome. They're down to a singular version of each chromosome. And this is when the chromatids are individualized in each cell. So now we're going to go a little closer into actual meiosis. We will start with interphase, like you're familiar with. You saw that in the mitosis video, and you'll see it here. This is where the DNA has been duplicated. The centrosomes are getting ready to move to opposite sides of the cell, and the DNA is just getting ready to form the actual chromosome structure that you're familiar with, the Xs. Now for meiosis, there is a difference here in prophase one, where these are your homologous chromosomes. Let's just call this chromosome number one, like in the picture we saw, where the arm of this chromosome, say from dad, and the arm of this chromosome from mom are hanging out over each other. And if you can tell, the colors are switched. So they switched genes from here to the tip. Same thing happens here. So this is where a step called crossing over happens. And this introduces an incredible degree of genetic variation to any individual who perhaps ends up developing from one of these gametes. That is the result of meiosis. So uh, just understand that these are homologous pairs, like chromosome one from mom and dad. They cross over to swap genes, but then you're still left with two full chromosomes, chromosome X's for the pair of that particular chromosome. So for chromosome one, you still have two versions of it. And don't forget, the spindle is beginning to form, the nuclear envelope breaks up, and the centrosomes are moving to opposite ends of the cell. Now for metaphase two, this is just a little different than it was in mitosis, because you've got two pairs of each chromosome, okay? So let's call this chromosome one and chromosome two. If you can tell, the microtubules connect to the centromere of only one of each of the pairs. And this is metaphase, so they've lined up along the middle plate there, and they're getting ready to be pulled apart. Now they are not, these chromosomes are not connected, but they are very close. They're not connected, but they are very close. So when the process moves into anaphase, the next step, do you see that, like this says, sister chromatids remain attached. Basically, you're getting one part of your chromosome one pair on this side, the other part of the chromosome pair on this side. And if you look at the color difference, you can tell that this part of the number one chromosome pair has a very different genetic blueprint than the one that it's being separated from. So this is just meiosis one. The difference between this meiosis and mitosis is that in prophase one, you've got crossing over. In metaphase one, the microtubules are attached only to one of each of the pairs of chromosomes because they are full pairs. And then in anaphase one, sister chromatids are not separated, just the pairs of chromosomes are split and then separated into two different cells. So right here is where telophase one and cytokinesis happens. You've got a copy of chromosome one here and chromosome two, and then even though it's still chromosome one, it's a slightly different version of it and a slightly different version of chromosome two. Then cytokinesis occurs, making two distinct cells. This is where your two haploid cells form because now there is only one version of each of the genes. It's only got one of chromosome one, not two. Even though chromosome one is duplicated, it's only got one. It doesn't have the full chromosome from mom and the full chromosome from dad. It's got half. Now, essentially, the steps like you got familiar with in mitosis will happen again. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. But it's just a little different because the genes are a little bit different. Although for this one, the steps are much, for meiosis two, the steps are much more similar to mitosis where you've got the chromosomes, the centrosomes form, the nuclear envelope breaks up in prophase, and then in metaphase two, each individual chromosome is lined up along the middle of the cell, and the microtubules connect to the centromere on each chromosome, here and here. Now remember, we've got two cells, so they've got different genes, well, different versions of each gene in them, where they then move to anaphase two, 
and this is when the sister chromatids are pulled apart okay showing you how you've got two individual cells with one chromosome one one chromosome two one chromosome one one chromosome two then telophase two occurs once the chromosomes are pulled to the side the nuclear envelope begins to redevelop and then finally cytokinesis splitting the two cells so these are haploid daughter cells so meiosis one the resulting cells from meiosis one go from ha diploid to haploid and then from meiosis two the haploid cells remain haploid it's just separating the copies of each individual gene okay to view it another way this is how you can look at it in terms of a life cycle. So let's start kind of where all of us are existing today. Fully mature male and female diploid adults. Your cells have 46 chromosomes. And within your body, meiosis occurs so that you are generating either egg cells if you're female or sperm cells if you're male. Each of these having only 23 chromosomes, these are haploid, and they have any weird crazy combination of genes that you can imagine. As you see, it depends on what crosses over, you can't predict it, and then how they get separated between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 introduces another level of variation. So two individuals come together, one sperm fertilizes one egg, so you've got a completely new individual with a completely new combination of genes. Once that egg cell is fertilized, it's called a zygote, which then has the full and proper number of chromosomes to begin developing into a whole new individual. Through mitosis, they grow and develop until again they are mature and meiosis is occurring within their bodies. So here's the cycle. Basically, some of your cells, most of your cells start as 46, but through meiosis, they divide and you have basically a haploid portion of your existence even though it's extremely small and once first fertilized you're back into diploid. Now this is a comparison between mitosis and meiosis. We're looking at meiosis 1 now. Prophase 1, you're good. Your genes are duplicated, ready to go. Although in mitosis they're just duplicated. In meiosis, they perform some crossing over in prophase. And then moving to metaphase, in mitosis, all of the chromosomes line up along the middle and are separated by the centromere. But in metaphase one, just homologous pairs line up and are separated. And then for mitosis, anaphase and telophase divide this initial cell into two, so you are left with two individual cells, two daughter cells, that are identical to the parent cell. Not in meiosis. In meiosis 1, then you only have two haploid cells because you've only got one copy of each gene in each cell. And then in meiosis 2, those individual cells divide again, so they each only have half of the genes needed to make a full individual. In sexually reproducing organisms, Three processes lead to most genetic variation. Independent orientation of chromosomes in meiosis, crossing over of chromosomes in meiosis, and random fertilization. Each pair of homologous chromosomes consists of one chromosome inherited from the father and one from the mother. Here we have color-coded them blue and red. Each pair of chromosomes lines up independently of the other pairs in metaphase one of meiosis. Here you see one of the possible arrangements and outcomes. There are two different ways that each chromosome pair can line up. That means that in the organism shown here, with the diploid number of 4, independent orientation of chromosomes at metaphase 1 can produce gametes with four different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes. In a human being, with 46 chromosomes, more than 8 million combinations are possible. Now let's look at how crossing over creates even more genetic variability. During prophase 1 of meiosis, homologous chromosomes pair up very closely and corresponding parts of two non-sister chromatids may trade places. This process of crossing over 
creates variation by producing chromosomes that combine the genes inherited from two parents. Here the process produced a total of four genetically different gametes. There are many ways crossing over can occur. In humans, crossover events happen an average of two or three times per chromosome pair, greatly increasing the variation among eggs and sperm. Note that crossing over produces some parental gametes with chromosomes like those of the parents and some recombinant gametes with a mixture of genes from both sets of chromosomes. Independent orientation and crossing over occur simultaneously during meiosis, multiplying the number of genetic variations among gametes. Because each pair of chromosomes lines up independently, and crossovers can occur almost anywhere along each pair of chromosomes, it is possible for a human being to produce an almost infinite variety of gametes. A sperm fertilizes an egg, producing a zygote. The random nature of fertilization adds to the variation arising from meiosis. Each parent is capable of producing a huge variety of genetically different gametes. The number of possible combinations among their offspring is staggering. Theoretically, one human couple is capable of conceiving a number of genetically different offspring that is far greater than the number of humans who have ever lived. Okay, pretty cool, right? So, he just answered the question, why sex? Genetic variation introduced by crossing over gives the species a greater opportunity to have genetic combinations that provide a, an evolutionary or adaptive advantage to who knows what's going to come along in life. Uh, so through the crossing over, partner selection, independent assortment, there are, as he stated, millions of different ways to introduce variation into the species. Now, it is possible, as you see in meiosis, where the chromosomes line up along the middle, that some of them don't line up correctly or don't get pulled correctly to either side of the cell, and you end up with a gamete cell that has the wrong number of chromosomes. Like in this picture here, uh, the abnormal zygote has an extra chromosome, and this is relatively common. Typically, though, a, a zygote with this condition does not survive. Uh, typically it's what they call spontaneous abortion. In fact, I believe the last I checked, the majority of pregnancies end up that way, but it usually occurs before a woman even realizes she's pregnant. Now there is one that, in terms of the way genetic abnormalities can affect you, that is relatively mild where an individual will survive. That is called trisomy 21 and that is Down syndrome. So this is one of the very, very few genetic uh, abnormalities where an individual can survive. And it's possible that it might be due to the fact that on chromosome 21 here, there are very, very few genes. It's very tiny, so it may not affect or, you know, have as large of an effect as if it were chromosome number one. I don't, I would feel safe to say that I don't believe anybody's ever survived if they had a trisomy number one. Now, once again, we went over what you knew or what you've known from before. We looked at your chromosomes. You've got the vocabulary. We went through meiosis. I know it's very, very delicate. That's why there are plenty of videos, and I want you to call me if you have any questions. Um, we've talked about why genetic variation is important and that there can and are often mistakes in the process nobody is perfect on a cellular and molecular level. Okay, thanks.